Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sony Virtual Roadshow. It's absolutely fantastic to be here tonight. We here at the Society of Photographers uh, hosting the webinar. We've got Gary Hill as the guest presenter tonight. We've got Sony, Mark's here from Sony to uh, help on the tech side. And it's also supported very proudly by Wax Photo Video. So a massive thank you to them for helping us with this uh, webinar tonight. Today should have been the first day of our set of road shows. So we should have been in Merseyside today in Atri Racecourse doing our first road show. Tomorrow we were going to be in uh, Solihull. And then on Thursday we should have been in Lincoln. So we put all this kind of content together, ready to go for the road shows. And we thought it'd be an absolute shame to miss out on delivering this to all the members out there. As I know so many people are asking the questions about mirrorless and the technology behind it. And what it's like to go from, uh, you know, the standard digital SR and, and actually convert over to mirrorless. So we've got Gary Hill to, to lead us through. So thank you very much, Gary and Mark, for joining us tonight. It's brilliant to have you both on board. Yeah, Pleasure. good to see you. Um, yeah, um, I think I'm now 20 months into being mirrorless. Right, I okay. Think. Yeah, so I can definitely tell you ups, downs and, and all the things with it. Um, I, th I think you jumped in with both feet, didn't you, straight away? I did. I did. Well, what happened was I went to these set of roadshows at this this company, <laughs> the societies, um, and, and for 12 months of these roadshows, and, and we told I think we did 12 because we, we went on to Ireland, didn't we, the following year as such. Yes. I yeah, got yeah. a view from, uh, from, from a certain person at Sony and his cohorts at the time. And so I thought, do you know what? And I went up to a couple of studios and tried – the Sony cameras, and then without telling Mr. Mark from Sony, I went and bought one. Uh, and I bought one, on, and it arrived on the Friday, and by Friday tea time, I'd boxed up my Canon kit, sorry, my alternative DSLR kit, and <laughs> sold the following week. So, uh, and since then, and I thought, it's, it's definitely one of those things, you've got to go in feet first. And then I took some abuse at the Society's Convention from, uh, from Mark for... Uh, for doing it after I've given him abuse for a year, but I've got to say, um, no complaints from me. Brilliant, and um, Mark, th thank you as well for joining us tonight. Uh, obviously, you're here kind of like on the tech side, so if anyone's got any questions uh, on the technical side or sales and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I mean, you've been on the road shows now for quite a few years, and obviously, come to the conventions as part of your role with Sony. So you're, you, you're hearing a lot that our members are, are asking those questions about mirrorless and. Uh, about about making that switch it's becoming uh, a lot more apparent uh, as time goes on that people are looking to make that kind of switch isn't it you're absolutely right and thanks for this opportunity again uh, colin it's uh, great working with you guys and great working with uh, advocates or creators like, like gary i don't know we got more planned and so i'm looking forward to them yeah um you know when i worked for panasonic many years ago we we supported you at the road shows and it was a no-brainer when I joined Sony to, to do the same. Um, talking to a, a similar like-minded audience that are obviously very, you know, good at photography, using their own kit, whatever it is, but looking to, when they're at that point, to look to switch and, and change brands, then we have the opportunity to show them what our kit is made of. And, you know, it's a shame that we can't physically meet, you know, members and 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 the audience to show the kit in front of them. So this is a great way of... Um, trying to get the message out um, through photographers like Gary. You know, this is all his work. It's, I've had nothing to do with what Gary presents and, and other advocates that we work with. It's uh, we're here to kind of answer the questions around why why should I go mirrorless? Is it Sony I should be looking at? Um, hopefully, um, and it's our responsibility then to try and you know bring the product to life. It, it is great, and this has become quite. Uh, quite exciting what we're doing and uh, you know more of it so thanks again for for this opportunity oh you're more than welcome it's, it's great to, to work as part of this team and it's great that the three of us have managed to uh, get all in tonight and uh, put our heads together and come up with this so uh, for the members out there which are watching uh, you know please do ask questions uh, Gary has got a presentation uh, put together which kind of goes through quite a lot of the stuff about how the, how he changed over and his thoughts on it. But if you do have any any questions, then please post them in the comments and yeah. uh, we, we can answer them halfway through or do a bit of a Q&A afterwards. We'll, uh, we'll go with the flow. Um, but also, um, if, if we run out of time tonight, we have got more webinars lined up 
So Mark is back with us on July the 9th. So if we don't get through as many questions as what we can, then we will be back again to answer as many questions as possible for you. Cool. Right. If you're Excellent. happy, I'll share my screen and we'll get up and running. Yeah, definitely. So once you've got that, I'll pull it up. Excellent. Let me go. Cool. Ready when you are. And we're up. So I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bow out. Uh, are you uh, are you? Do you want to stay on, Mark, or do you want to bow out while Gary goes through the presentation? Uh, yeah, I, I can stay on. I don't mind. Or let, yeah. let Gary let Gary have his moment, and we'll um, we'll we'll be in the background. Yeah. Really? Any, okay. Any questions that come up, guys? Because I can't I can't see your questions. Then uh, either you guys jump in at an appropriate time and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks, right. Gary. I, like I said at the start, it's about just coming up to 18, 20 months since I went to Mirrorless. Um, and, and there's a few reasons why I did it. And, and I'm going to tell you what's and all from my point of view as a professional portrait photographer and trainer, really. Um, I never planned on going Mirrorless. I never planned on going to Sony. Uh, I'll be entirely honest. And, and the one thing I do want to point out is that my move to the system was totally organic. Um, in fact, like I said, in the chit chat at the start, Mark didn't have any influence on that. He didn't. He didn't even know I was doing it until after I'd done it. Because uh, that's just the way I work. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be supported by Elincom and, and and that and Digital Lab and all of that. But I still, these are things that I do off my own back, and um, I've got to be convinced that what we're actually talking about is the right thing for me before I get involved with anything like this. So I just wanted to just make sure that everyone knew that this was me and not me working at uh, Sony as such before when I came into this. So I'd say the journey one year on as such, um, and the reason it's the journey one year on is that a couple of webinars, a couple of the roadshows last year with Colin and Mark where I talked about moving over. So this is now, I've had, I'd say, 18, 20 months to have a real look at the system, really test it out, um, as a portrait photographer and, and just let you know what I think as such. So I've shot everything on it from newborn babies to commercial to food. The only thing I haven't done, I don't think, is shot architecture because it just it isn't what I do. But everything else, uh, children's portraits, women's portraits, families, all of that, have all been tested on this Sony um, over this time as such and an awful lot of training around around the UK and Ireland and, and some in Europe, et cetera. So, you know, I really have put it through its paces as far as my kind of workflow. Um, why did I change? That's a really, it's a question that people ask me. Now, I was a DSLR user for over 10 years. Um, I originally started out beyond that as a landscape photographer when I used to climb in the lakes. Excuse me, but that was on film. Uh, in those days, and then I put it away for many, many years, and then I bought a DSLR, became a pro a few years later, um, but I'd always use um, standard DSLR, and didn't matter what I did, and, and I got pretty good with it, I got my associate after a couple of years and things like that, but I, I always found that I was, just something was lacking for me, and I had I, I changed up to the latest model in the range from, from the supplier that I used, um, and I'd used it for 12 months, and I was happy with it to a certain degree. But I just always felt that uh, there was just some focus issues that that just it wasn't as accurate on the focus as often as I wanted it to be. And at first I thought it was me, but then I looked at the way I shoot, and then the way I shoot portraiture, in particular headshot portraiture, is I shoot locked down on a tripod. So... When I'm doing that, I knew that the issues were then starting to move away from me and my handling of the camera as such. And, uh, and perhaps being down to the system I was using or, or just the SLR full stop with the mirror being in place. So I did have issues where I would take four or five shots and three would be in focus and two would miss. And I would calibrate regularly. I sent it off to be calibrated. And then I would regularly use Vocal and calibrate myself. And I would get it to where it was accurate, and then the next shoot would come along and there'd be some lens creep or something like that, and it wouldn't work as much as I wanted to. You know, I, I paid a lot of money on glass, had a lot of, um, you know, lenses that would shoot down to 1.4, 1.2, and I 
couldn't use them to the full potential. Uh, and that disappointed me a little bit because I do like shooting quite wide open on certain subjects um, and wanted to use the lenses to the full potential. And I wasn't getting that. The other thing that I found was that, I, I, you know, some of my favourite lenses in my old system, like the 135, had no image stabilisation. So I was having to either crank up the ISO way too high when shooting outdoors, say I was shooting dogs that were moving and I needed, you know, five to uh, 500 to a thousandth of a second exposure. Um, then I was having to take the ISO to really, really high levels because there was just no um, image stabilisation in that. So I didn't actually intend to move systems. I didn't intend to go mirrorless. I, I laughed at them at first, I've got to be entirely honest. Um, I looked at them and I thought, mm, how will my customers perceive that, that kind of thing. Um, but having seen Terry and Mark at the road shows and a few other people, they had piqued my interest as such. And as a result of that, um, there was a couple of times there was a new one photographer, Emma Jane, uh, and she bought into the system and I went to do some training with her and I had a play with hers and I was like, okay, this, this, is, this is interesting. It's fresh, it's sharp, all of these things. And then I went up to see another photographer friend of mine, Lisa McCormack, up in the northeast. Um, she was she was still shooting Canon and Sony side by side, and she went, "Well, why don't you just use my Sony today and see what you think?" And then I used it, and I thought, "Okay, it takes a bit of getting used to and all that." But then I came home and I looked at the files, and that's when I started to get a little bit converted as such. Um, and then I revisited these issues I've been having with my DSLR setup. And, and almost um, bought the bullet straight away. But while I'm doing all this and trying it, you know, the things that I did, I went away, thought about it for a little bit longer. I needed to upgrade one of my camera bodies, and I thought, you know what, rather than just get another of the same make and keep that system going, I'm going to try it. Um, and I went and bought the Sony A7R III. Um, I knew that if I really wanted to, I could get the Sigma MC11 adapter or the Metabones adapter and use my Canon lenses on it. But I didn't. I bought two lenses to start with and thought, if I'm going to buy into a system, I want to give it a fair chance because the adapters are very, very good. But I wanted to make sure that I was using native glass on a native camera so that they, you know, I was getting a true test of, of how it was. And a few things that I liked immediately. Um, now, I'm a fairly big unit, but eventually after a day shooting or shooting weddings back to back or something like that, you know, the weight of a camera does, does tell on you. And I found that the Sony, while not being super light, it was definitely a lighter system. You know, and I picked up things like the Fuji. I picked up uh, the Olympus the, and, you know, the Micro Four Thirds and all of those. And they just felt a little bit not quite right in the hands for me. Um, though I'm aware that newer models are very different and all of that. There was something about the Sony that, you know, it felt good in the hands straight away. The ergonomics seem to fit me. Now, they don't fit everybody. So, you know, it is important that you try. And, you know, it's funny because I went from, from a DSLR with a battery grip on all the time um, to even uh, I was given a battery grip from a friend of mine for the Sony, and I actually, after about six months of using it without, I found that when I put the battery grip on, it didn't feel right. So I actually like the fact that I've got a super light, not super light, but I've got a lightweight camera and lens sat in my hands. And, and, and actually, after a full day shooting in the studio or on location, I'm less fatigued. I don't like using a strap, but I use a hand strap on it just so, but it's so light that I can let it fall off the hand, onto the hand strap and just walk around with it while I'm you know, changing sets up or moving a light around without it worrying about me. Whereas with my old system, I've had to put the camera down. Another thing that I liked immediately, and, and it's been a big game changer for me, is having the live view for natural light shooting or ambient light shooting, because you get that instant response as to what you're doing with your settings through the screen and the viewfinder, and what you see is what you get. Um, so I'll go on to that in a little bit more detail later on, but it's definitely been a big game changer for me that I'm a natural light shooting. Um, I can't couldn't really go any further without saying just a focus system. After using the DSLR with the mirror, 
and getting the irregularities in focus, switching to mirrorless, uh, and just instantly, you know, getting sharp images, you know, time after time after time, being able to push, you know, not even top of the range lenses, like my 8518, which is the cheaper of the 85s in Sony's range, and knowing that I can shoot it wide open and that it's hitting focus, you know, 99 times out of 100 instead of four out of 10 before. Um, and, and they were things that, that I took to straight away. Now, I remember when I bought this camera and I played with the other twos to, um, that other people had, I never, ever thought I would use the back screen to compose. Never, ever. I was always a viewfinder. In fact, the, the 12 months previous to this, I'd, I'd, I'd had use of three medium format systems and I'd taken two to Italy. I'd used one um, for a whole week elsewhere and I'd literally... I was almost on the on the border of buying medium format system. But again, I found that they all had little issues that, that weren't quite, quite right for me at that time. So I never thought I would use the screen on the back. But honestly, using the screen has been a big, big game changer for me. You know, I've put these images in because they were in one of the image makers the other month. Um, these were all shot between 1.8 and 2.2 on the Sony. You know, fairly wide open. Um, with the focusing system. Now, I'll be entirely honest here. Um, when I had the camera a few days, and, and bearing in mind, I bought the biggest Manfrotto tripod I could find at the time with a big head on it because I'd just spent 12 months using um, medium format systems. And by that, I meant I'd used the GFX, and for you, I'd used the Pentax 645, and I'd used the Phase 1 um system that all been on loan to me thank i was lucky in that respect so i had this big tripod in the studio and then the next thing i did was put this little tiny sony on it with an 85 mil lens and honestly it dwarfed it i still laugh at it when i put it on now because it just is so small compared to what i was used to and and, and i've got to admit within the first couple of weeks of using it i was a bit concerned about the build quality and how robust it was how robust the mountains were those kind of things I, i'd read rumors about getting wet and and all of this and uh, you know the usual things that go through a professional photographer's mind but um you know i, I can say to you in a little while that after 20 months it's, it's had some knocks it's had some some bashings it's had some hard work and freezing cold weather red hot weather uh, and the build quality is, is equally up to standard of anything else out there so i mean pleasant pleasantly surprised with that i thought it was just going to be my studio camera but no it's been everywhere with me um after having used the medium format and had people come in the studio and go oh my goodness what is that camera sat on the tripod in the corner i was a bit concerned what people would think about me from a professional point of view with with, in effect, a camera that does look small, it does look compact, it perhaps hasn't got the feel of a DSLR with a, set, a big 7200 on it, though if you put the Sony 7200 on it, you know, it's got that feel again. And I was just worried that people would not take me seriously. Um, I have to say, having used it for everything from commercial work, bridal work, weddings, families, kids, training, all of that, Nobody's ever batted an eyelid other than just saying about, oh, wow, was this new technology or something like that. So while I was an advocate of going big with the medium format because I thought it would give me a presence in the studio, honestly, after 20 months, I don't think anybody's ever commented that I've been playing with a toy camera apart from other photographers playing with it. The other thing I'll say is that a lot of people said to me, oh, my goodness, don't go Sony, don't go Sony. The menu is so confusing. Well, I think I'm a camera buyer's dream, really, because apart from setting it to uh, RAW, RAW captured to both cards, setting it between uh, my JPEG previews between colour and black and white, and being able to turn the live view on or off, that's about the extent that I need the menu on a camera. So for me, it, it hasn't been an issue at all, the fact that the menu system is different, and that's coming out of a system that I'd used for 10 years where each progressive model you could fudge your way around the menu because they were all so similar. I mean, it has taken a little bit of time, but, you know, new things do. But um, the ability to set custom buttons up for, for certain things can bypass three-quarters of the menu for you in no time at all. 
So after this time of using it for so long, you know, what have I learned? And I, I wanted to be honest with you guys and come back and say, well, what have I learned genuinely? Um, after having shot temp one way for 10 years, in this last 20, 18, 20 months, my shooting style has changed. Having gone from that camera at the face all the time, you know, it, it has changed. Uh, people do love it. I, you know, I, I, I was concerned about that, like I say, about perception. But when I'm shooting younger families or tech-savvy savvy families, everyone being able to see, you know, oh, gosh, that's, that's modern, that's cool, that's, you know, oh, it's Sony for a start. Um, people do love it, and when you can show them the features and a couple of features I'm going to talk about in, in a little while, I found nothing but praise for it. So people do love it, and you know, commercially it's brilliant. Again, I'm going to go into these one by one, um, and the workflow that I've developed as a result of this um, is efficient and it is flawless. Um, and the thought of going back, in fact, I picked up one of my alternative, uh, one of my DSLR cameras off a friend the other the other week and tried to shoot with it and I was like oh my goodness this does not fit in my workflow being able to jump on the train go down to London with your camera kit in a rucksack instead of a roller case um, is is a big difference uh, for moving around and, and also shooting on location where you can keep your bag on your pack with all your kit in it rather than you know having to put it down in between shots and stuff like that so what I've tried to do is throw a few images in that I've shot over the last year or so. Uh, this was a bridal fashion shoot up in Edinburgh. It was freezing cold, and I mean really freezing cold. Uh, it was in January or February this year, I can't remember. We were shooting in and out of locations, but again, we were shooting that mix of ambient light and, and uh, flash, for example, and it was just it was just such a doddle using all day. Um, a lot of people said with the older ones that there was issue with battery life. Well, I can tell you that shooting in sub-zero temperatures all day uh, in the middle of Edinburgh and I didn't go through one battery. That just shows that, you know, that it's equally comparable to the SLR now on battery life. Um, the only difference is, one thing I've found is that I turn it off in between shots, whereas in my DSLR I used to leave it on. So say... The model goes for a change or the family getting repos or something like that. I just flick it off so it's not got the screen on. But it's, uh, you know, certainly no issues with that and, and shooting in all different environments. Literally from full sun with flash bottom right to shooting in the shade. You know, it copes with it all. And, I, you know, I've tried to pull out images here that show that I have actually tested it as such amongst the environment. So... I raised those points how it's it's altered my way of shooting and what I've learned over the years, over the year or so. So I just want to tell you really what what difference it has made. Shooting style, like I said, I never thought I'd move my way my my eye away from the viewfinder, even though it's electronic, um, which again gives an amazing clarity. One thing I found is that it's fantastic not having the camera at my face. I shoot quite a lot of. Um, a lot of children, which brings me down to the bottom point. And, and you've got to remember that, that, particularly with younger children, toddlers and the like, they're used to face-to-face -to -face contact, they're used to eye contact. And putting that big black camera in front of your face to take pictures can mean that, you know, you lose that connection with them. You only need to lose that for a second and then you've lost your shot as such. And I've certainly found that, um, that not having the camera at my face, being able to drop it to waist level, flip the screen out, and concentrate on the actual subject has made for better, even better connection in my pictures. And, you know, it, it really, once you've learned that style of shooting, you know, I'd never go back to having that block of the camera at the face. Um, shooting style again, when shooting in natural light or ambient only, the live view is just phenomenal. Anybody who knows me knows, and I'm still the same with flash that I am an absolute stickler for using an instant light meter. Um, it's the most accurate way, with particularly with flash, of measuring my lights. If I'm doing multiple light setups, I can set my ratios to within a tenth of a stop, get it exactly how I want it with using an instant light meter. Now, obviously, you could take test shots and things like that, but you're never going to see the, the accuracy that a light meter will give you. And I was exactly the same outdoors, exactly the same outdoors. I would meter the light every 
every time it changed, I would re-meter and just do it all over again. However, what I found is with the live view and the exposure that you see through the through the screen or the viewfinder is that actually I'm seeing that changes in exposure as the light levels change. So it's very, very easy then to change my shutter speed or change my f-stop to correct that or even my ISO. Um, and, and particularly because I do use the back of the camera, the screen on the back of the camera, what you see is what you get. So literally, if I'm shooting an ambient light scene, a natural light scene, and, and I, I want it underexposed in certain areas or things like that, I can actually just dial in my exposure more accurately than my light needs will do it. And, and literally, when I press that button, what I see on the back of the camera is what I get. Um, and that has been a massive game changer. And at weddings, it's made it even faster. It also means that I can I can put things like flags or reflectors in, so I can block light off certain areas or kick light back in before I even press the shutter button because I can see it on the back of the camera and see the adjustments that I need to, to make. So it means that from a client's point of view, they're actually getting less camera time because they don't need it. And, and one thing I always say to people is that 90% of the people you photograph don't want to be there. So the less faff that I've got to do after starting to take shots, building poses, all of that, then the less I have to do because I can get it accurate before I put them into the poles and then start working with them, then the easier it is for them and the easier it is for me as a photographer. So live view has been a massive game changer for that for me. Um, I shoot everything from model portfolios, babies, kids, families, commercial, all of that. But when I'm shooting dancers, for example, um, having the eye autofocus, again, I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit, knowing that I can lock that eye on in focus at the start of a jump or something like that, an area that they're starting to do, and that they can move across the, the set and still track that focus, particularly if the camera's on a tripod, that I can just guarantee that I'm still going to hold that focus nine times out of ten times. And that's really good when you're working things that, you know, same with children. When I've got the camera, I can take it away from my face, take it away from directly in front of me once I've locked my eye focus. And as I move the camera down, where you normally get that shift in uh, focus, and, you know, if you've locked your focus and recomposed, because it's eye tracking and it's continuous focusing system, I can move it from my, near my face where I'm composing to lower down, for example, so I can connect with the child and still the eye focus will keep tracking and I know that the shot's going to be there. So it's a real, real change in my shooting style, but it's, it's definitely led for better connection and more accuracy when I'm shooting images as such. Um, yeah, mix of studio ambient light, just again, just showing different things that you can do. You know, I've got um, a baby in a crop that was actually shot at the Society's Convention. Um, family shot in Wales uh, last year. Natural light shot of um, a model in the cat suit in the middle. Just literally, it's a polystyrene board behind her. Um, and then the, the other one was shot at the NEC, at the photography show. Um, with Loretta Hope on, on one of the trade stands. So again, it, it's, it's been everywhere, this camera, and it, it's had a go at all different things. I said at first I was worried about perception and stuff like that, but what I do find is that people love it. Um, the technology in it attracts the, the younger people. They want to see what it is. They want to see what it does. They want to see the screen. They want to see the eye-tracking focus when you show it on the kids, all those kind of things, and, and they're really impressed with it. Um, the other thing with more sensitive subjects that are um, not happy at being in front of the camera, then actually they're less intimidated by it because, again, you know, older people sometimes and people who have, you know, some educational needs and, and just people in general actually get intimidated by a camera at your face and by moving it away and being able to, it's a much smaller form format that they become less intimidated by it, in my opinion. And, and I've had some better results with people than I think I would have done with a traditional system. And like I said, I can't reiterate this enough. Children love the fact that it's not at the face. I was doing a family shoot on Saturday and being able to have a teddy in my hand, the lightweight of the camera means I can hold it one-handed, lock that eye focus, 
move it away from my face and I'm waving the teddy about above it to get the, the baby's attention. Um, it's not in my face and it's simple. I don't create that block. So, you know, I am finding that people really, you know, have totally kicked out my suggestion that they might be have the wrong perception that it's no longer professional and things like that. And I know a lot of other users that are using it um, are finding the same thing, that the stuff they were worried about is it's just in our heads. It's not a perception thing at all. Again, shooting food just for a change. Um, again, these were shot with a mix of flash and LED panels and just being able to dial that exposure in to move flags into place um, and get it all right before even pressing the button. And, you know, sausage roll shot at 1.8 on the 85. Quite close in. So I can just focus on that texture on the front one. It's just, you know, having that accuracy of focus and... I know it's going to hit the same spot every time. It does make it easier to shoot. Um, commercial shoots. Again, I've done a few things. Um, commercial shoots with it. I used to have to tether to my MacBook, um, which I can still do with it. And Capture One is flawless with it. They actually have a Sony version of Capture One, uh, which is brilliant. Um, and it tethers flawlessly with that. But having the Bluetooth facility, built into the camera and the sync with the Sony imaging uh, that means that I can just Bluetooth straight to my um, tablet or to my phone and then drop it to the client or to let them see it on my tablet or phone straight away. It means that we're not getting people crowding around a, uh, a screen that we're actually being able to get on the shoot. People can look at stuff and I can just fire things to them in seconds and they're seeing that live shoot experience. Um, Rather than having to download Dropbox, all of those kind of things, if there's a couple of in-camera shots that are banged on I can, and they want to go and, you know, show partners or the users or email, I can, again, just use the same facility to just bang it straight to them. And, the, you know, they can go away with a few sample images away. And, and the in-camera JPEGs are so versatile. You know, I shoot a lot of black and white portraits and I have my JPEG set up in camera not to, you know, not to shoot as a JPEG for it, but actually to have it set up for how I'm going to process the raw file afterwards so I'll have extra contrast, bit of sharpness, those kind of things. And I, so that when I look at my JPEG and I can, again, flick it to my phone for a better look, stuff like that, um, I know that it's exactly how I'm going to look at it when I when I process it. You know, the, the in-camera JPEGs are so versatile with that and the different settings that they have and also the way you can customize those. But I can actually do the same with a client. If I really want a particular look, I can color it, I can um, set my white balance, all of that. So the JPEG out of the camera, because I'm confident with my lighting and things, is pretty much how the final file is going to look. So again, just for a quick sneak peek and things like that, we can do it straight away. And, and that is really versatile. Um, like I said before, I was looking at moving from DSLR to possibly medium format because of image quality. But I have to say, again, after shooting medium format for nearly a year prior to going mirrorless, that the image quality, the dynamic range and the file size, you know, 42, 42 megapixels on the R3, 61 on the R4, you know, we're into medium format territory anyway with file size and, and resolution. And... Um, I've got to say dynamic range is, for me, as good as it needs to be. You know, massive dynamic range. I can pull detail out of shadows, um, hold detail in highlights, whereas I know with certain DSLRs and, and the system that I use was great for highlights, but you can pull detail out of shadows. Another system that I know of, um, another manufacturer that was brilliant for pulling detail out of shadows, but don't dare blow highlights. What I'm finding with, this, with the Sony is, is that you have got such a dynamic range that you can push and pull your files quite a long way. Um, so you're getting that dynamic range, you're getting that image quality, you're getting that sharpness that, that commercial customers want. And a decent file size, 42 megapixels will fill a little billboard all day long. So, you know, it is what people are looking for commercially. Um, and I've had no issues with it in that respect. You know, whether shooting a wedding, shooting a, a workshop and shooting in a mix of ambient and flash, shooting for uh, arena removal cycles at the bottom with a GB triathlete here, 
or the other image at the bottom right, shooting. Um, I put boxes actually on a on a seminar, just shooting outside and just controlling that sky and all of it. it it's been through it all. We've got bright sunlight and flash on the the wedding image. We've got flash on the um, subway image. All of that. It's just handling it all, and the dynamic range means that I can, you know, control the specular highlights on the swimmer, on the triathlete, while still holding details in his black neoprene and, and things like that. Stuff that I would have struggled with without medium format before, if I'm honest. Without bringing in even more lighting to just balance that exposure. So, again, just to try. Workflow. Um, workflow is massively important to me, whether it's a capture or whether it's um, in post production. Um, anybody that's worked with me knows that I try and get it as right as I can in camera, 99% right is what I aim for in camera. Um, and having the extra dynamic range um, has allowed that because I'm, I'm not getting away with, but I'm able to use less lights in a, in a location scenario because I know that the dynamic range will still provide me the detail that I would perhaps have had to put an additional light in. So while it's not made me lazy, it's made me more efficient. You know, places where I'd have had to put individual fill lights in for different areas, I'm finding that I'm not having to do that with the Sony because I've still got that detail in the shadows. So it is getting away with carrying less kit and stuff like that. I can shoot all day without fatigue, like I say. You know, I'm getting the same results with my 85.18 shooting wide open as I needed a 7200 at 200 mil before to get a similar depth of field. But I'm not having to carry that weight around all day so I can shoot, shoot, shoot without fatigue. Um, particularly when I've done back to back weddings um, last year, then I found that actually I was far less tired. Just, you know, got a little 50 mil, 35 mil, 85 mil, and just switching between those all day. Um, I'm not carrying around as much class and stuff. Like I say, workflow, ambient light, weddings, when that, or even just an outdoor family shoot where the light's changing all the time because it's a sunny day with a bit of cloud. The live view means I'm not having to forget about my exposure because I'll see it if the cloud's going, I'll see that my, my screen goes dull and I can make the changes. Whereas on the DSLR, I might have just kept shooting, shooting and missed a bit that it, the light and the change with the live view. I'm not doing that, so it means I'm more accurate with my exposures, so I'm shooting less, and even more importantly, I'm after to cool less and less processing afterwards. Um, the other thing I have to say is I've used, like I say, really expensive kit, and the quality of the Sony glass is easily up to par with any other glass out there. Um, from, you know, I, I'll never forget Mark letting me use the, the A7R4 with the... 13518, and we were at the Sony Roadshow last year, down in Cardiff, actually. And I shot a member of the audience from the stand, and we're talking probably 25 meters away. Um, and with the resolution, and I shot it at 1.8 wide open, but I saw 640. And when we zoomed in, you could see individual eyelashes on the face. So the quality of the glass and the quality of the resolution is just phenomenal. And it really does mean that your workflow is tight and efficient. This is probably the biggest test that I've had as a photographer and the biggest test that my camera has ever been put through, I think, was uh, the National Pet Show uh, last year at the NEC. Um, and I'll go on to that a little bit further. And I've called this page, it's all Mark's fault. Um, and I mean that in the nicest way because I'm one of these people that, that likes a challenge. And when somebody like Mark, who I'd worked with a little bit last year, um, came to me with this idea of shooting a live, having a live shooting area at the National Pet Show. Most people would have actually said, sub that for a game of soldiers and run away at that point. But me being me says, well, if Mark thinks we can do it, then we can do it. So without thinking of any more than that, we, we'd agreed to it. And we, we then, after running a workshop um, on shooting pets at my studio, um, we had a sit down and a chat and we came up with a plan um, how we could design a trade stand within a pet show. You know, this isn't a photography show, this is a pet show at the NEC 
with a shoot area where, A, we could shoot anything that came, but also we weren't going to lose somebody's prized pet. Um, so Mark and I worked on this, more Mark than me, I've got to say, and we came up with, an, he, he told me how much we made to shoot and how I could do it. Uh, and we came up with a plan and designed a stand with a shooting area and a trade area. Um, and even on the day that we were putting it together, it was just like, are we really going to get away with this? How many dogs and cats are we going to lose while we're doing this? Um, we, we spoke to Charlie at Click Props and we wanted something that was very unique, but also I'd just, just had some, I'd done some shoots with some pets and kind of come up with my own workflow and editing process and backdrop design and textures that I wanted to use um, to create what is kind of my pet look as such when I'm shooting pets. So we spoke with Charlie at Click Props and worked with him. And we designed a purpose-made bespoke backdrop and floor, which fit the stand and the trade area of the stand that I was going to use for shooting. And we, we made it all come together. And using the Magnifix system, we magnetized it to, to the actual frame of the stand and ended up with a shooting area that, you know, imagine it is a trade floor. It is got carpet underneath and all of that, but we still managed to get away with it for two days. So we added in some some my own con lighting system. Um, I had to come up with an idea that would shoot anything at whatever size. And, and the eventual system that I came up with was a one light boom, boom system with a strip box that we could just about vary the height of, but it had to do for everything from, as you'll see in a minute, from dogs to cats to hedgehogs to alpacas, the lot. Um, and we had the greatest two days, the most exhausting two days of my life, I think, um, at the pet show doing this. So these are just some of the quick images that we got, parrots, dogs, cats. Um, I put the image on, the, the, this image of the Spaniels um, struck a chord with me because this lady came up and she was so sweet. And, and basically, I'll tell you what we were doing, we were shooting any pet that wanted to come to the stand. We said, we will shoot your pet. Um, and she got a dog, which was quite an old spaniel, and we sat it down and, and shot a photograph of it, and it was beautiful. And then she, she came up, picked a dog out of the stand, and she came back and she went, thank you, this is, uh, you know, she's got cancer, and this is probably the last photograph I'll ever get of her. And at that point, me and, and the assistant that we were working with at the time, we said, well, you've got to get back in and have a, a photo taken. And she's like, no, 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 I don't want it and all this. I said, you've got to. I said, because if this is going to be the last photograph, you've got to get one together. And we we put it back onto the set, adjusted the lighting a little bit, shot them both together. Now, it's not an award-winning portrait. You know, it's a nice portrait of a dog and their owner. But what's more important is it's that last picture that she's probably got with that dog. So, again, just to talk about the power of photography and sometimes, you know, what you can actually do for people with a camera. But like I say, we went from shooting these two crazy parrots that I was petrified were going to fly off and get lost to, you know, huge dogs and Bengal cats that are very unpredictable um, to people. And actually, we had a couple of people that we actually shot portraits for because Mark had said, you know, that we would shoot anything that came to the stand. So if we wanted a picture of the child, we would shoot a picture of the child. And we did. So we ended up uh, with me and an assistant, Mark and the guys on the trade side were dealing with inquiries and stuff like that, but also really helpful with those. But we shot a total of 178 animals and humans shot on the one set with one lighting setup in two days. Now, if that was just shooting 178 people in two days, that would have been so easy. But bearing in mind, we were sometimes dealing with something the size of a hedgehog um, to the size of four alpacas that you imagine you're up and down on your knees all day long. And, and honestly, it was the most shattering experience of my life, but it was brilliant. So we did a little shot from an albino hedgehog to four alpacas, um, all on the same two days. Um, because I was happy with my workflow and my capture, and again, what all the things we talked about, I managed to get all of those edited and uploaded to Pixie Set in one day. And that was individual hand edits. It wasn't batch processing. It was literally cheating everyone as a client, as a client um, portrait of their animal and getting it done that way. And, and again, having that efficient and consistent workflow, recording details, everybody had details of the gallery. And when we went live with it, 
you know, and the last time I looked, because it's still live now, we'd had something like over a thousand different visitors to it from people that were friends of the people that had the animals photographed and all of that. So that was a real live scenario of shooting under pressure. Um, Cause you think 170, you know, you average that out at 90 animals a day, that's 10 per hour. Well, we weren't shooting every hour because, you know, we were having to um, get these animals to come to the stand, record the details, all of those. So it was, you know, it was a full on couple of days. But yeah, we had some fun with that. I learned an awful lot about alpacas as well, and I wouldn't have one if you gave me one. Uh, they have separation anxiety, so they've got to be next to another alpaca at all times or in the same area, things like that. There was a, um, we didn't have any aggressive animals apart from one bulldog, um, English bulldog, that the owner, you know, we always check, is there any issues with it? No, put it on the stand, and it, it had a real deep growl at the, um, the lady who was using as an assistant and afterwards the owner said they'd only picked it up two or three days before and I'm like you could have warned us things like that so again you know a fun day out but it was all Mark's fault we learned a lot that day those two days but we also had a lot of fun um, and it's amazing what you can achieve with one light because that's all I set up um, the other thing that I found the mirrorless system to be brilliant for is education is a big part of my business. Training is a big part of my business. Um, I transitioned from mirrorless to mirrorless from DSLR in a weekend. And actually, after I got it on the Friday and had a little play with it, my first job with it was to go up to digital lab and shoot the professional headshots and business shots for the for the website and I still had my Canon kit at the time and I took it with me just as a, you know, scary cat in case I don't know what I'm doing with this Sony. Um, but by the end of that shoot, I never picked it up once, never picked up my, my Canon at all and I shot it all uh, on the mirrorless. So for me as a professional, it had to be quick and efficient changing over. Um, I normally advocate RTFM and it's read the flipping manual if anybody's non-military or anything like that. But I never do it myself. Um, and there's a couple of times that actually with the Sony, I did sit down and read certain sections of it. So I would have been even quicker at transitioning if I'd read it earlier. Um, learning the new focusing method and using eye focus has been a game changer for me. Um, using the eye focus and, and just seeing when I'm educating people actually that are still on traditional systems, you know, that we've got moving subjects, toddlers, things like that, and they're like, oh, I can't get that. It's too quick or it's not in focus, all of that. But using eye tracking focus um, has been unbelievable, unbelievable for being able to show people that you can do things that I never thought we could before. Um, the other thing is that because I use the screen on the back of the camera, I'm able to get particularly one-to-one -one students or small group students to literally be on my shoulders and they see my composition and exactly where the position of my camera is, any tilts or anything like that. And they see the result before I press the button on the back of the camera. And I found that that's been much better than taking a picture where, you know, I've got the camera in my hand or something like that. And they've not been able to see exactly which one was the, the frame that was correct. So doing that, um, using the back screen, so they can see my composition literally as it's shot, um, has been a massive help, a lot of people have told me. And um, quite often, I never thought I'd say this, but I'll shoot a couple of raw images, set my white balance from those, and then I'll shoot JPEG, because I'm happy with the quality of the files that are coming straight out of the camera. I've nailed my exposure, and you know, all I'm gonna do with JPEG is just a little bit of tweaking. So I will quite often shoot JPEG, which I would never have done before in a DSLR system except at, at an event. Um, yeah, talking about pets, here's four. The one top right of my big dog, who's currently sat down here snoring. I've just chucked a slipper at him because he was making too much noise. Um, got my third overall in the Society's uh, International Pet Photographer for the Year. Class at the convention, and uh, two cats at the bottom, both gold and both been merited as well in the 2016. So, you know, no no issues at all with image quality. 
really, really good kit. You know, taking it outside, and again, this was actually shot um, on a Canon 135 with the MC11 adapter. Um, and again, seamless transition. You know, I prefer the Sony 135 all day long, and that's my next on my hit list and was about to be pre-COVID. Um, but again, if you you know you got another system and you want to try the MC11 adapter, it's brilliant on Canon. Um, and like I say, I love the quality that I'm getting. This was a high contrast situation with sunlight coming over the back and was able to just control it and get that dynamic range that I want with that shallow depth of field. Um, talked about um, weather sealing and things like that. Um, Shona Dixon, she's a society's photographer, actually. Um, I was booked to do, go up to Scotland, up to Lockerbie, and shoot her and the boys. She wants a portrait with the boys. When I arrived there, it was bouncing off the floor with rain. So we made the decision that we'd go into the woodland and see what we could get on the day. Um, literally, my camera's on a tripod. I'm in the rain shooting them under the tree canopy because I wanted the light. I couldn't push them any further back. And again, it got drenched and uh, dried it off straight after as best I could. Uh, and no issues and again shooting it was 39 degrees in venice when i shot my eight jewels um and it had been red hot and cold with the heat without any problems at all and you know it just a flawless system in that respect i can't have all these positives without some things that you may think there's got to be something wrong with it and you know what there are a few things that you need to work around or get used to as such. Um, like I say, I use the A7R3. I'm hoping next year I'll have the R4. Uh, they are big files. They are big resolution cameras, you know. The A7 III is much, uh, is 24 megapixels, I think, so much more used for a wedding photographer. But I love resolution, me. I love the ability to have that detail. Um, and 42 megapixel files are going to be big files so you need big ram on your computer to process it um, big files so you go through hard drives like they're going out of fashion but again what i do find is actually i'm not shooting much more gigabytes per session because while the files are bigger i'm more accurate with my exposures and what i want to get and i'm shooting less images so the trade-off there is pretty good uh, the one thing that is a learning curve um, quite a lot of my clients are are people with a certain amount of experience on their faces, shall we say, uh, and being super sharp, and again, shooting teenagers and things with acne. Being super sharp, you capture skin details that sometimes when you're post-processing, you rather it didn't capture. So, it, you know, while workflow's fast, that captures something like that. If you want shooting beauty or something like that, and your, your subject's got bad skin or newborn babies, it is going to capture all that detail. So that can sometimes mean that you've got to do a little bit more skin work than you did before. But I can honestly say that there are my only, there are no regrets as such, they're just things I've had to learn with. You know, I can cope with big files and big RAM. I've got a better computer. I can get external hard drives, all of that, not a problem. And I take sharpness over being out of focus all day long. Well, I'm talking about focus. I shot these at the weekend for testing out some new backdrops um, with some own stocks. Um, good friend of mine and a great model. Um, and I went in the studio. The light was beautiful. I've got big windows down one side, well, both sides, actually. And where I normally reach for my flashes, I said, you know what, we're going to have a really organic session and shoot lots of natural light. So I've got an image on the left there showing you my actual setup, and it's just window light with a black polystyrene board to have contrast on the other side. But I was shooting here. This one's at F2. And again, looking at the finished image, you can just see the clarity in the eyes and, you know, how sharp it is. And it's just every shot was like that. You know, this was just window light. I, I moved the backdrop, so I've got a white wall there, and I've just kicked a, a triflection, the new... Uh, Clip props reflector underneath here just to keep a little bit of light back in. But this is shooting on an 85mm headshot, so I'm probably what, meter and a half away? 85mm at f1.8, and it's just hitting focus every single time. It's just giving me that dreamy fall off that I want, and just the mask of the face in focus and letting everything else just blur out. Same again, even through glasses, the eye focus is still nailing those lashes and the eyes. You know, again, another 1.8 image, 
shot through fake glasses, but they are glass, you know. And I, my first concern was that when I first started shooting with it, that would it still get the eye focus through the glasses and, and all of that, whereas I'd had issues with my DSLR. And actually what I used to do if I was shooting wider open with the DSLR was focus on the bridge because I was worried that it would focus on the, the glass rather than the actual eye. But again, the eye tracking has just nailed it here. And I put this one in. Uh, this is a 300% blow up of a headshot shot in natural light at 1.8. You can actually see myself and the pupil. But just to show you our individual eyelashes, and this is straight out of camera, no sharpening, nothing. So literally, this is the raw file on a screen grab. And it's just, you know, it is that sharp. Just one, I know I've lots of other camera systems got eye tracking focus, but you know, the Sony one. And one thing I think, what I also want to say about Sony is usually camera manufacturers that bring out new features and you've got to buy a new model and things to get those new features. Sony have been amazing with their firmware updates. They'll get something that comes, say, on the A9, uh, on the, like the new the eye tracking and stuff like that. And then it cascades down through firmware updates to the other models. So there's been two or three firmware updates on the A7R3 that I own that have just increased the, the, the quality every time. And, and unlike, I'm going to say this, some of the manufacturers will throw things out as new features and then let the public troubleshoot them. Um, touch wood, I'm finding that all the new features they put out, because they're cascaded down from those higher models, or, or different models, like the sports focus on the uh, A9 and such, is that actually you're not getting issues, you're just getting more features on your camera. So this one, just again, I was at Click Prox headquarters shooting some backdrops last week, two weeks ago, and I wanted to push, just see how good it was. So this was shot up F1.8 with a strobe, and I asked the model to step forward and spin the dress at the same time, so she's moving in two planes, lock the focus on the eye, um, using a fairly fast flash, and that's why there's no blur in the, the dress movement. But at 1.8, so this is my lens wide open, it's actually hit focus on the eye, no problem at all. And it's 100% sharp on that eye, even with a moving model. Again, just showing you that clarity that you get from high resolution and, and things like that. So pretty much that I can't really find anything to complain about. You know, I love it. I wouldn't go back to DSLR. I would cry if you prize it out of my hands. Um, I, I can't wait for, to get the R4 on myself. Um, obviously, COVID's put pay to that for a little while, but, uh, you know, it's a system that I've brought into, and I'm really glad that I have. Um, and hopefully, I've just given you a little insights about what I've what I've actually liked and 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 been my learning process with it. Um, because I am a bit of a luddite. I'm 48 years old, and I thought new technology would be beyond me. But if I can manage it, anybody can. Again, another trip outdoors. My, my dog can hit 40 mile an hour. She's very rarely still, but I'm still nailing focus at you know, wide open lenses, those kind of things. So, you know, I'm really, really pleased with the features of the camera. The dynamic range, we've got bright sunlight in the background, black fur, and it's it's still holding it without any real processing. You know, it's really good in that respect. And of course, my favorite model, my little supermodel boy, again, shot wide open. He's actually got a garage door that's fluted behind him there. It's a wooden garage door. But throwing it out again, shooting at 1.8, or it might even be wide, it might even be 1.4 on this on the 50, um, has just thrown that out and given us, you know, the look that I wanted at that time. Um, I know Mark's going to talk to you a bit more about offers, but, um, you know, this, this event's supported by uh, WEX, and they've got some unique offers for people that have, you know, got this link from the webinar. So it's definitely worth if you can make a note of those. Um, Sony giving an extended warranty, an extra year warranty on any UK registered products, not grey imports. And I know that Mark will definitely want to talk to you about the cashback offer. So I'll just leave that on screen for a couple of minutes um, 
Do you know what, Colin? I forgot to ask if there's any questions at all. No, it's it's fine. Don't worry. But uh, a really interesting insight into uh, into your journey going from uh, you know digital slide and going into mirrorless. Just before we move on to the Q and A, I thought it'd be worth just reminding everyone that we're going to be back on July the 9th with Mark. Mark's going to be doing a webinar on thinking of going mirrorless. Um, so we'll try and get a few a few questions tonight. But if you've got any burning questions, then do keep them aside and. Uh, we'll be back, uh, as I say, on yeah, July the 9th. For that, yeah, like, uh, you want to talk technology, you better talk Mark than me, because I'm just a dumb to talk. <laughs> so so that, one, that one's at 3 p.m. On July the 15th, we've got Wedding Photography Express with Stephen Neeson. Uh, so that'll be a fantastic insight to his uh, work in the wedding uh, photography industry and, of, of course, using the Sony kit there. And then really? on July the 28th, we've got Terry Donnelly coming to talk about his project he did with Wiltshire Air Ambulance, uh, and again, how how the uh, the kit that he used helped him produce the images that have uh, gone on to win many awards and all that kind of stuff. So there are dates for your diary. Uh, so do check them. They're obviously in our events uh, page. So if you go on the Society's Facebook page, you will see all the uh, events there. But yeah, uh, uh, Mark, you've also organised some fantastic uh, offers for us, um, exclusive for this webinar. So yeah, do, do, do you want to run? Do you want to run through them, bud? I'll stop yeah. sharing screens, and Mark can be seen. <laughs> um, yeah, if you took note of the uh, details, um, great. Uh, the Wex URL, please register. Um, and by doing that, I think it's on the screen now. Yeah, I just popped it up. Uh, please register. Uh, then what Wex will do is send you uh, the offers that we're doing exclusively. Um, with the webinars through the societies and you can only get these uh, offers with WEX through this link so it'll come in the form of a, an email where you can then browse at your own leisure um, the deadline to get the best offers is, is up until the 31st of July so you've still got a number of weeks um, and this is where this message comes in the summer cashback um, I won't go through every single line, but if you are looking, for example, at uh, an A7 Mark III via WEX, then UK and Ireland has a cashback campaign uh, that gives you uh, another £200 off. So whatever comes through the offer will be on top of this. So by um, taking those details, please, we are giving you the opportunity. If you're in the market of looking to, to buy Sony kit, whether you're a new user or an existing user, or whatever um, we are giving you these opportunities to save some money and the warranty link um, a lot of people don't know this and um, uh, it is out in the domain but of course a lot of shops have only just reopened so you might not find it online uh, if you have bought a, a camera this year or, or a lens uh, you uh, make sure that it's listed on on the link website and that will entitle you to a free year's warranty you must register uh, but it's registering your product and uh, you get, I think it's about 70 quid. Uh, we give you this on top of whatever you've got. So please make sure you've done, you, you, you do that if you haven't already. And if you're then obviously looking at taking advantage of the offers, then go to the website once you've purchased and um, gain, you know, obtain that extra year's warranty. So, you know, we're throwing a lot at, at this um, because uh, it's a good time to buy now, uh, now that we're starting to see some changes in our, in our daily routine, um, post, you know, within lockdown. So, uh, yeah, please take advantage of the offers. Brilliant. Thank you. Right, we are going to uh, whip to a couple of questions. I know time yep. is slightly running on. Uh, so, again, if you do have any burning questions and we don't get to them, then please join us on July the 9th at 3 in the afternoon where we'll have Mark doing a more technical thing uh, all about the, the, the functions of the cameras and uh, we're looking forward to that. So we've got Joyce is asking, are there any issues with the interfaces uh, with Photoshop, Lightroom, or Nick? Um, as long as you're, you know, you're on CC or one of the more modern versions, uh, stay with the updates. Uh, I know some people have had issues with Lightroom, not recognizing the files, but as soon as you update, certainly I, I've had it, what, 20 months? And I've used the R4, which is the latest version as well, and I've had no issues with that. The only thing I will say is you need some RAM. That's yeah. all. Yeah, no issues with that at all. Brilliant. Um, I think it was Helen what was asking this. Do you know how the Sony compares to the Fuji X-T3? Um, it all depends which model you get. Uh, I'm not going to say that 
I, I've used the XT range. I've, I've had a play with them, you know, and the great cameras. Um, what I'll say is I chose to go Sony. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to no, find. We had another as a, as a user, it, you know, cameras are great nowadays. There's no bad camera on the market anymore. But I will say that you know that eye tracking system and the focus and the sharpness and colours on the Sony meant I didn't look elsewhere. How's that? That's a political Perfect. way of answering that, isn't it? Well, that, that goes on to a nice question that we ha actually had off Sarah, and Sarah said, "I'm confused with so many Sony cameras uh, there are." What uh, Sony model do you use and why? I use the Sony a7R III. Um, I looked at the a7 III, but I wanted the resolution. I'm a studio photographer primarily. I like big files. I like big prints, those kind of things. Um, and having that 42 megapixels or 61 if you go for the R4 means that I've got so much more to play with if I want big files. You know, if you ever come to my studio, I've got seven-foot prints up. Those kind of thing. I know Digital Lab have used um, 60 by 40s of mine on their display stands and things like that. Um, as a portrait photographer, my suggestion would be the R3 for the extra resolution, particularly if you're also dealing with toddlers and stuff where you may have to shoot slightly further away. It gives you that ability to crop in. Um, if you're a wedding photographer, maybe the R3 is an overkill. You'd be better with the 3, which just gives you a little bit more dynamic, uh, a little bit more ISO performance. Um, but the trade-off for that is you're down to 24 megapixels. Well, that's big enough for any any photo album for a wedding photographer. So then my, I went for the R3 because I want the resolution. I like to pixel peep, and I like to make sure that it is sharp at 100%, those kind of things. Um, but as a wedding photographer, I would probably, if I was shooting weddings, I'd probably go for... The just the A7 III would be for me, and I think you'd agree with that, Mark. But I tell you what, they're also knock the 64 or 6500 or 6600, uh, 66,000, sorry, because they are phenomenal compact cameras. We, well, not compact because they are still interchangeable lens, but for their size, they punch way above the weight, way above the weight. And I, I'm, I, I would definitely be looking to have one of those more compact versions as a third camera in my system as a, a backup backup but more of because actually i'll take it places where i won't take my big kit but yeah that, that's my views and, and like i say i love the a7r3 when mark gives me an a7r4 then i'll be <laughs> <you know. laughs> it isn't gonna ever happen right any more mate yeah, I, I thought it's just worth mentioning. Quite a few people were tuning in halfway through uh, and have stuck with us right to the end. So I thought I'd just mention that if you did miss the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, don't worry, you will be able to watch the full webinar on our Facebook, uh, the Sighties of Photographers Facebook page. As soon as the, the live broadcast finish, it should be there for you to watch out. You will see, so even if you've missed something, and you've been watching and you just want to catch back up, uh, then you can do so on the on the Facebook page. Uh, let's go to this question from Pamela next. Uh, I have an A6300, is that the way you say it? Is there a way I can see my live view on a tablet or monitor to help with macro shots and focus stacking? That's definitely one for you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing so well. Uh... <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. can feather that straight to your yeah. tablet. Uh, well, yeah, you could, you could. Um, there's many devices out there. Uh, micro HDMI cable, you could, you could tether, um, or uh, tethering tools, etc. Uh, you can use the app. Uh, so if you haven't already, uh, Image Edge software. It's a Android and uh, iOS uh, free downloadable app through the stores. Um, you make sure you switch the Wi-Fi on the on the cameras um and uh then you pair pair the two together and then you can see a live view on on your tablet obviously if you've got a phone it's smaller uh screen than the than the tablet so the bigger the larger it is the, the better um yeah so um there may be some third party software out there that you'd have to do a bit of research but yeah you can you can do that on most yeah, I'm sure you can tell it's catch you one as well with it and, and lightroom as well i just find lightroom a little bit unpredictable with tethering but you'll be able to Certainly capture one um, with a tether tools with a micro HDMI. You'll be able to do it straight to that and see it on your monitor. Although our cameras don't do <laughs> like some of the brands internally, then of course you can do that 
uh, with focus peaking, uh, so manual focus with the, the the bright colors to show that you're in focus, and then you can obviously stack those layers quite easily. For example, in Lightroom, so yeah, you 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 could do that. Yes. Perfect. That wasn't too bad. And then we've got one last question come in off Ian. Yeah. He he says I, I've got loads of lenses that I've heavily invested in over the last few years. I'm tempted to switch to Sony, uh, but don't want to get rid of all my lenses. Are there any adapters? Uh, are they any good? And how do they work? I, I, I can I can speak for Canon and certainly say that the MC11 adapter is well. I'll, I'll tell you the story. Um, having used the Canon 50 mil 1.2. It was sharper on the Sony with the adapter than it was straight on the Canon body. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it isn't quite as fast to focus as a native lens is on the body without the adapter. There's a very slight, slight speed, but we're talking milliseconds. You know, certainly if you can go native. The other thing to look at is, and I'm sure that Wex will, will be doing it as well, is what I did is I went from a system with seven lenses. Right, that's what I had in my camera bag, seven lenses. I now have three because I actually looked at what I actually shot and, and I actually found that well, it didn't cost me anything to change because I traded in and sold my other system and I actually, it hardly cost me anything to change. So if you, you might have loads and loads of glass, try it with the adapter, but what you might actually find is that you can then trade it in and get the native Sony glass. It does work better, I will be honest. But the, the MC11, I think the MC11, I think you'll agree, Mark, is probably the best of the adapters. Yeah, I, 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 to I totally agree. I mean, we, when we, we, we do physical events um, and hopefully you know, do those sooner than, than later, um, we, we bring these products with us. We, you know, I don't, or we don't endorse them and recommend or anything like that because they're obviously made by other manufacturers. But we bring them because we get asked a lot of questions around how does it work, uh, even you know, at the, at the road shows, we get a lot of people obviously bringing their kit and we ask them to try their uh, DSLR glass on, on the adapters. Now, the MC11 adapter you're talking about is made by Sigma. Um, and one of the reasons why we use it a lot is because it really does work um, and it works very well. But, you know, I stress that a native system is far superior than yeah. using a third party adapter. Um, and you've got to remember that the lenses that are native to the system are tested uh so you know i hate using the word future proofing because it changes all the time but you'll find that the the you know the hardware is 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 made for the handshakes made for each other um i totally get it you know there's a lot of people out there who have heavily invested in glass over time with different brands and rightly so um you know i i was a DSU, dslr user when i was at uni uh not so long ago um but uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, retailers, are, and you know, when we do these offers, it, 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 we don't just do them, you know, I mean, it costs us money to do it, but we don't just do it for the sake of it. Um, we do it to, to help people move across. And I know a lot of retailers like Wex, um, their stores are opening now and online. Uh, there are facilities to talk to somebody, whether it's virtually or by phone. Um, and they could give you a good quote on what you've already got, which may be a lot more, maybe less, I don't know than what you would sell it maybe privately after fees and things like that. So it's worth, you know, if you are thinking of moving and switching, you know, the adapters, yes, but look at the native side and then you could be saving with money that we're, we're, we're uh, funding that we're offering uh, through WEX and other offers that you could be saving quite a bit of money. So do talk to your retailer. Um, and if you are out and about and, and your stores are open, pop in and say to them, look, uh, this is what I've got and this is what you may be sat on. And it might be, you know, it might be in your favor um, and they will take uh, that product off you. And there's a big demand for secondhand cameras, especially DSLRs. So, uh, you know, if you're in the market for buying a DSLR, a secondhand DSLR, it's quite a good time to buy. But um, if you are looking to, to switch, it's a good time to sell at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the months of June and July are really good to, to look at, you know, switching to, to, to Sony. Um, but there are huge amounts of options, and we'll go in more detail on the 9th of Ju uh, July as well, uh, in a, in, a, in uh, around um, uh, adapters and so on. So, fantastic! Uh, that leads us on nicely. I was just going to say that there's quite a few questions we haven't managed to get through tonight. Uh, 
but we w- I will pitch them at you. I'll, I'll save them in my uh, my notepad, and I will fire them at you on July the 9th. Um, so just before we leave, just to remind everyone, if you want to go ahead and take advantage of the fantastic special offers that Wex and Sony have organized exclusively for uh, tonight's webinar, then please visit www.wex.co.uk forward slash Sony hyphen events hyphen offers forward slash and that will take you to a landing page where you can fill in your details and they will then email you the uh, the offers uh, obviously because they're, they're not released for public they're just for uh, people that have been on this webinar so thank you very much gentlemen for joining us tonight it's been an absolute absolute pleasure to, to to be here tonight and take this the roadshow that we would have been on today uh, and now been sat around a hotel bar in Solihull debriefing on the day but we've <laughs> done it virtually instead so uh, it's been too good good to catch up with you guys and Thank get you. the content out there that I know all the members have been uh, looking forward to hearing out the road shows but we've done it virtually instead so a massive thank you for all your time and effort for putting this together and we're looking forward to the road, uh, the next. I was going to say roaches. The next webinars coming up in the series. Uh, some good ones coming up. So uh, yeah, thanks we've, again we've for organising. Great. That's thank great. you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll you see you all soon. Take okay, care. Bye. Bye. Bye.